Welcome to the other episode in our Suicide Squad bookend. Last week we did Dirty Dozen because the bad guy team saving the day. This time it's the other really bad DC movie. This is where Halle Berry takes the DC world by storm. Zing. Welcome to Death Cinema. I'm Brian Gillis. And I'm Steven Maltmanex. Like most people, we love going to the theater and catching latest releases. However, sadly, put a big dent in your wallet. Fortunately, living in the digital age makes the viewing possibities endless from the comforts of home. Many of these films that you can see right from your couch, we're ashamed to say we missed, despite labeling ourselves cinephiles. So join us as one or both of us cross off a title from our list of shame. It can be an all-time essential classic. Or an underrated piece of cinema that's worth giving a shot. Hell, it might just be some trashy film we want the other's opinion on. So sit tight and join us as we pay off our debts, one dollar at a time. What the hell is wrong with you, Phillips? Your incompetence is staggering. All my life, I felt powerless. I've never stood up for myself. But then... You can come out now, it's okay. I think maybe I'm in the wrong... Everything changed. But you were reborn by accepting all of who you are. You can be free. She's very self-confident, almost angry. I'm sorry, what was that? Allergies? This person doesn't like to play by all the rules. Amateurs. Deep Sage jumps around like a cat. What should we call her? You heard of her? Oh, yeah. Hot. Black leather. Whip. <laughs> yeah, I really like this movie. Like, not in a joking way. It could be, you could argue, like, oh, you know, history is kinder on things later down the line. But I thought this was a very coherent, very cohesive, not necessarily a smart movie, but for being a popcorn flick, it's beyond decent, like it's good, it's fun, it's funny, and the action's kind of okay besides the overuse of I wouldn't CG. call this bad either, like I think it's absolutely ridiculous, it's definitely mm -hmm. over the top, but it is consciously so, I don't think the CG's bad. I it's think it's bad. appropriate for, <laughs> no, for the movie that this is, for how cartoony and just like insane this is, I think it's appropriate. Like it's this appropriate was the... for the time. It's 2004. Well, no, I mean, but for the type of movie too, like if this was The Dark Knight, you know, something that has a serious dark tone, then CG like this is unforgivable. But for a movie like this, that is just fucking crazy, yeah, I thought the CGI fit. Like, for a basketball scene that's as crazy An as this, when it's amazing basketball live, scene. Yeah, I mean, just for something like that, the <laughs> what happens there, it's like, it works hand in hand with the cartoonish CG here. So no, I don't think it's bad. I can see why people hate it right away. I can see why it wouldn't work sure. for anybody, but it's definitely not bad. It's the same as Suicide Squad, except that film actually has issues, lots of them. This one doesn't. Like, it embraces its weirdness. First off, the director's name is Pitot. Yeah, I mean, that's one of those things right there where... Is he the McG of France? Is that I was, <laughs> yeah, I was, I'm wondering what's going on there. I mean... No, I researched him. He uh, was a French... Well, he is French, but he's a visual effects yeah. supervisor. He worked on a lot of stuff. He's mainly done stuff with uh, Jean-Pierre Jeannot, and he yeah. was also the second unit director For on Alien, Alien Resurrection. Resurrection. That's where he started out. So he Worked on, like, Messenger, the story of Joan of Arc. So yeah, other like, French big movies. You can see where that sensibility comes from, especially the stuff with Jean-Pierre Jeannot. Like... Yeah, I mean, this movie, it's weird because it's like, if you take the setup for Wanted, you know, someone that just has this job that they hate and that they just go through all the normal everyday shit, mm -hmm. you take some of the, like, a bit of showgirls, you know, just like... A lot of showgirls. Yeah, I mean, just the bad dialogue and also just how they try to make Halle Berry so sexy in this, but it just, it's pretty laughable. And then you make that a movie that's directed by Luc Besson. This is what you get. This really is. It's... An interesting kind of pastiche of just campy superhero stuff like the 60s era Batman plus turn of the century comic book movies because this has a lot of similarities to 2005's Daredevil when you especially that basketball scene 2003 but was it 03 <laughs> yeah it was and then the director's cuts 2004 okay. but I mean yeah that's another thing the basketball scene here at least works because the this basketball movie is silly. scene is like the exact cousin 
of the playground scene from Daredevil. But the playground scene in Daredevil, like, it doesn't... It's horrible because that doesn't belong. Like, that is a dark, I don't, dark movie. Hey, I don't care about that. I'm just I saying... I know you love the that The way scene. it's shot, the amount of fun that's there, it was uncanny how close it was to this. Because yeah. I'd seen that scene before. Tyler from Future Wars Pod actually showed it to me months and months ago, like, when I first met him on the internet. Mm-hmm. And I was laughing so hard, like, I can't believe this isn't Catwoman. It was the first time I'd ever seen footage. I was like, oh, I understand why this one Golden Raspberries, and why everyone says it's, like, a horrible movie. I can't believe they put that in a superhero flick. But then in, like you said, like, in the grand scheme of things, it fits the tone perfectly, especially the relationship between um, Patience and, and Benjamin Pratt's character. Tom Lone. Tom Lone. Like, Which, oh, I mean, let's, let's talk about the names Patience in this movie. Phillips. Oh, right, because she's such a pushover, and, you know, she's very, very quiet, and she's able... She's willing to deal with all the crap. Tom Lone, because he's a detective he works alone. that works better by himself. Uh, Ophelia Powers. I liked her. I but like the, the name is yeah. what I'm saying. The they, name they were because bad. they were I, I all bad, man. Th- it, no, it's not subtle. Like you superhero know, it's, it's not, movies generally have bad names. I know, but this is like this is unsubtle, and I'm not saying that's bad. It's just it's silly right away, and it you know it's just you can't. It's like Vicky call, Vale. It, you can't call this like horrible or anything because it is just so consistently over the top that it's just having way too much fun with it. I don't think there's a moment where someone here like turns in a bad performance that no. is like Mm-mm. bad in the sense of they don't know what they're doing. Everyone Campy. here knows what this is supposed to be. Like there's a reason why this won so many golden raspberries. It won like worst picture, worst actress, worst Which screenplay, Halle Berry accepted worst everything. Personally. Yeah. She showed up to the ceremony with her Oscar and accepted the raspberry. She held up both over her head. She was proud to win that award she knew what she was doing here like we said in the intro or she was storm and x-men she was doing the serious comic book movie and she got the opportunity to go completely the opposite direction and it's funny because we have an episode for cat people which we put out when keanu was released this is similar to that just the setup i mean yeah you don't have like the eastern european town where they're cursed but just the way that this title sequence works with the whole Egyptian roots and the cats and showing, like, the uh, the Mao and its history in America and then these little uh, snapshots of other, quote-unquote, cat women, I really dug it. I did, like, when I was beginning, I had, like, a lot of notes, like, what's up with these roots? Oh, never mind, it's just the history. It's like, what the fuck is a pitof? Like... Uh, well, <laughs> what, what's up with these weird eagle eye zoomed establishing shots? Like it was all well, it's negative. Not really, I don't think it's a title sequence where I really learn anything. It's just newspaper clippings yeah. that are basically like thrown around, and you just see flashes of them. So it doesn't you give set, me much of the a history. It sets the tone though. It gives you kind of a backstory to well, it just, the cat angle. It kind of says like, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff here, but it's not exactly well realized. So I mean, like. If you want to call this movie terrible, like in, right off the bat, that's not what I was. Terrible. Expe- I was expecting that though. Yeah, because right everyone got that title says sequence, it is. Yeah, I was just kind of like groaning, like, "Are you fucking kidding me?" But then, yeah, once you get to, uh, <laughs> I mean, especially that opening voiceover too from Halle Berry. I mean, right then and there, I was just expecting it to be bad, and then uh, just the sillier that it got as it kept mm-hmm. going, like I just I started enjoying it on a so bad it's good level, but. It's I mean, also, it's so good, it's bad. Yeah, well, it's just like, the the way that it's constructed in a coherent way, it's like, you know what, this can't, this isn't horrible. Like, yeah. I feel this is intentional after a certain point. If some, you know, if Halle Berry is taking catnip and just sniffing it in that way, <laughs> she's not doing it in a horrible way. Like, she fully just jumps no, into she, it and just goes for it. It's like, good yeah, acting. this is what it is. It's just silly I mean, acting. Like I said, yeah. this is campy 1960s Adam West Batman. I know, you and I are both there on that. Batman Forever or Batman and Robin, except not as homoerotic. Uh, if I keep on going down my notes, you know, it's like you have that really weird, the first time you see Midnight, which is like a pretty cool name for that cat. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's not an alley cat. What the fuck is it doing? And then my next note after that was like, oh, Patience Phillips is not Selena Kyle. Like, right away, when you learn that this is a separate Catwoman, when this is not Gotham, it's set in Cityside. It's a new city. It's a new uh, protagonist. It's not tied at all, really, to the DC Universe. It's a no. new take on that metahuman. Like, yeah, she still has the same abilities. She's still just as catty. She has the bullwhip and the leather outfit, and she's a jewel thief and stuff like that. But it's not her. In the same way that, you know, like the Dark Knight, the Nolan trilogy is not actually Batman because it's grounded in reality. 
Mm -hmm. like Batman. I mean, like that's Nolan's universe. Exactly. It's not actually DC in the same way that this isn't DC. Like it is a Warner Brothers movie. It's put out by Village Roadshow, but it's kind of like its own Elseworlds thing. It is by itself. If this movie could have been amazing, if it ended like the final shot when she's walking in the moonlight, if she like showed up in Gotham or something like that, I would have been. Amazing. Like, if I was in the theater and that happened, I would have been, like, standing ovation. I was like, yes, he's going to be in the next Batman movie. Uh, but sadly, that didn't happen. And this movie, you know, history kind of wrote its own disaster here. I kind of like the plot, though. I liked how it... First, we haven't even talked about this. This is the first female-centered superhero movie. Mm-hmm. And it was before the comic book movie was really a huge thing. Like yes, the X Men movies were out there. Daredevil just came out. There was like this two Spider Man really movies. But this is the first female led superhero movie with an African American woman. Well, that too taking the lead mantle. But even in today's comic book world, world where everyone watches either a superhero franchise in the big screen, the small screen, reads one, talks about it on a podcast, or reads the books directly, DC, aka Time Warner, took a big risk here by putting one of Batman's side characters into the spotlight because you know michelle pfeiffer kind of established the role in batman returns the three actresses in the the 66 show they really helped that too like she is a known rogue like she is a good anti-hero in the gotham city area but this is a huge risk and i can't believe so many people shat on it because this film is definitely targeted at a female audience when you get to the antagonist as a woman the yeah, big plot so sure, device though, is a beauty cream. If this is even like, so, like, yeah, sure, it's definitely targeted there, I guess. Mm-hmm. And I don't know for a, a female audience of the t- mid two thousands. I don't know how you could uh, sell this, at least based on uh, movies like I don't know thirteen beyond on thirty and all that stuff that was marketed towards them. Like different kind of movie though. Like yeah, this but, is. I, mean, I think the biggest that... thing that there was to compare this to at the time in that same summer within that uh-huh. same month was Spider Man two. And you have something not like comparable. that. Yeah, not th- like it, well, it's just it, it's around like that same within yeah. that same month. I think you have that movie, which everybody loves, which proves that you know you can tell really good stories with you know with really good characters and yeah. flesh them out much better. Like there were qu- a bunch of sequels around that time period for comic books that were like really just pushing the envelope, and then you have this. So. It's no surprise that, like, when you got something as good as Spider-Man 2, that people just don't want to watch something that's this silly or goofy. I think it's the same problem that we have right now with DC taking so much flack. I mean, people didn't like Batman vs. Superman. It was flawed, but they didn't like it because it wasn't a Marvel movie. Well, that, but I mean, I also think with Suicide Squad, it that's a movie that, you know, you don't have, like, big important scenes where, like, mm-hmm. oh, the UN is here, the World Council is here. Yeah. As important, like, you know, things are happening in the world that everyone is suddenly aware of that the world could end. No, it's far more quieter than that. It is an isolated incident. If you stay yeah. for the credits, they spell out why. Some of the, uh, just the first 20 minutes of this movie, it reeled me in really well. Like, it was, t- besides some some weird camera shit, like, when the first chase scene happens, there's, like, a red room and a green room and a blue room, and it's kind of weird. But just that, that, like, secret origin, the whole thing that leads up to patients dying... It was just paced really, really well. It set up Sharon Stone as the villain and a good villain at that. It makes this Catwoman sympathetic. And I was fully engrossed. I wanted to keep watching. And so when I finish the movie and I go on Wikipedia and I read the backlash, they got like a fucking nothing, like 12% of Rotten Tomatoes. But both uh, Roger Ebert and Roper gave this thumbs down. This is like on his his most hated film list. This is the guy that Everybody wrote... Everybody hates this movie. You go on Letterboxd, it's pretty much nothing but half-star reviews. This is the like, critic that wrote... It's among the worst reviews, I mean, worst movies ever made. To he wrote Valley of the Dolls, though, which I haven't seen, but I've seen clips, and that's pretty similar in tone to this movie. Yeah, but I mean, again, keep that in mind. I think that's the expectation of comic book films of the day. Like, no one was ready stupid, to watch something though. like this. If you, I, read... I don't think that they are today, but it's just like, yeah, I mean, we were getting serious blockbusters around that time, too. We had The Born Supremacy. Uh, we had iRobot. Like, you know, there was nothing lighthearted at that point. If you read a comic book and Catwoman's in it, better yet, if you're reading a Catwoman-centric book, if it's a Catwoman title, it is the same exact tone as this movie. Like, how seriously can you take someone in a leather suit pretending to be a cat 
jumping around, trying to make out with Batman. Like, she is a pretty silly character. Her name but is it's, Catwoman. It's a, like, it's a painfully silly movie. I mean, you know, there are things in here that I, c- I can absolutely see how they're groan-inducing because they're just really weird choices. Like, like the okay, CG you have, cat you, orgy. Yeah, it's like you're, <laughs> you're zooming into... Uh, a, a morning cat, and then you you finish the shot by going into its mouth, or like a cat literally breathes yeah, life, like ca- new cat life. Mist. Yeah, <laughs> it's Ali Bear. I mean, like you know, these are things that I mean, if you're not going into something to embrace the absurdity of it, and there's a lot of movies like that that you know, not everybody can just be prepared to watch something that's crazy because it, it just feels too retarded to a lot of people, and I can totally understand that. Uh, we were lucky; we both knew this was bad. We just didn't know why. It was bad, so our w- level I, of expectation. Now. No, that's like, what I'm saying. Really I'm would, saying our yeah. level of expectation was as low as possible. It was almost like seriously, if this movie was lower than we thought it was, if it was worse than we expected, I would have been shocked because I was going in with zero. Literally, I thought I was gonna hate watch this thing. Yeah, and I really enjoyed it. So I don't know if that's because everyone set up this shit threshold and it catapulted above it or if i'm just an outlier or we're outliers and this is just a good movie i I do think it's a good movie i mean i not only i don't think Mm -hmm. it's stupid either i think it's a really good satire it's i mean you know it's it's fun yeah but i mean also like you know this doesn't like the main plot the main thing that she has to stop is this makeup the beauty the beauty preventing yeah to prevent like you know this new beauty line yeah the anti-aging cream that's yeah that's gonna make it anti-aging but that is gonna be so addictive that if you stop then your face pretty much falls apart yeah i mean there is a really good social commentary there on just modern makeup culture and just how you know, it's literally treated as a drug in this movie. Like, it's not you, even just that, You have that, to get though. your fix. I mean, I, and it's, I don't think it's stupid because of that. It's like satire said, to me. This is clearly for a female audience because what a better message for women than don't use that beauty cream. You're better off without it. It is going to be uh, intoxicating. You're going to become addicted to it. If you stop using it, you're going to think you're ugly. If you keep using it, you're going to feel crazy. Like, uh, yes, you got Sharon Stone who has, like, what, what you say? It's like I have flesh, my marble flesh or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, that's the extreme, okay? They needed a villain, like a true villain. And she's way better than fucking Enchantress in Suicide Squad. Sharon Stone is just, you know, it's Sharon she's Stone. She's also basic instinct. Yeah, total I mean, it's, recall it's funny because mode. her career is pretty much dying at this point. Oh, like, dead. she's not nearly as big. And, I mean, it's completely fitting that she plays the character that she does in this movie. It's like right someone around. someone who just lost her status just because she. She yeah. got older. The time of this movie was the Basic Instinct sequel, Troy, like lots of weird choices. And I can't remember the last time she was in something big. Was she in Troy? Uh, yeah, I believe she was Achilles' mom. She had like a very quick, and maybe it was someone else, but there was someone who had just a quick screen presence. Huh. Um, I liked a lot about this outside of just the story and how fun it is. I am a cat guy. I love cats. I really wish that my cat would join me during the screening. But... You got, like, the first... Like, okay, she wakes up from being dead. She decides to sleep in a high place, which cats love. She falls <laughs> off, and then she lands on her feet. And I was sold. I was like, okay, she's a cat. You got that sushi scene, her hissing at dogs, uh, eating, like, tuna straight out of the can. The jokes um, are endless, the, honestly. The white like, Russian they, they line... So, they're so stupid. I mean, so that's my good. favorite line. But, like, if you're not willing to go through with moments like that, then yeah, you're going to hate this movie because it's so cheesy, but... I think it yeah, sells you, I mean, The you, white though. Russian line, hold the Kahlua, hold the vodka, no ice, I love that. It sells you on this shit if you give it a chance. Like, I think if someone like us just went in blind, you know, knew it was bad, whatever, it's on Netflix, you gotta give it a shot just because, I mean, DC's big right now, superhero movies are big, like, you should watch everyone, especially if you're gonna have the audacity, if you're gonna have the balls to call something the worst comic book movie of all time. Like, are people on at Variety and THR and just the internet on the whole retarded? Have they actually seen all these movies? Or do they take other people's opinions from the contemporary critical consensus and go, yep, it's bad? I think even then, when people say they want a fun comic book movie, they want something that they can take seriously on some level, as opposed to just something that is very, very cheesy and very over the top. That's I think is just very difficult for a lot of people to embrace, because when someone says, hey, this is dumb or this is retarded, I I can't disagree with it. You know, if this movie's logic is that they have a scene where 
Tom Lone has two versions, a coffee cup that says sorry and a paper bag. I like that, And then the though. way that they detect that is that the guy looking at it says, well, they're not the same person because this one here, you see the, the why, it's, it's a little crooked. Well, it's, it belongs to someone that's very outside sensitive of that, and quiet. Though, that, I mean, I'm, that just, is I'm saying true. like that scene when really, when you look at it, it's like, it's the same fucking person. Just it use your eyes. Though. Look at the damn no, thing. No, it's a big thing I, I in get, this I film. Get, I, get, the I get the, the dual film. thing in there, but I mean, yeah. come on. It's like, yeah, no, you look no, at that. Like, outside of the whole whole vast backstory with mm -hmm. like oh the blah 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 i just love the the way it sets up because it's true for just the superhero mythos not catwoman in particular I see just why that's true for this world for this movie's logic no, i see not why just that works this movie, but i'm still snickering at it i when think it all superheroes are, are confined by this like less so in the marvel universe but look at like the hulk it's either he's professor banner or he's mm -hmm. the hulk I'm, I'm talking about it's either, the process, though, specifically oh, of how sure. they did that. It the is fact silly. that they have someone looking at the handwriting. And I mean, yeah, it's. But my I point think is that, it that sold I can see that idea why really there's silly well. stuff like that that doesn't work for everybody. I agree with you. It works in this movie. I love I just, the quote. I absolutely see how it turns people off and why it would get them to say, this is terrible. Like, it, it's so easy to jump on this movie and say it's a piece of shit. I don't think that it is that. I, I agree with you. I think that it's much better constructed than that, and it's just that it's not going to work for a large portion of people that want to go along with something like this. I don't think so, though. I think at the time, like you said, this came out the time of Spider-Man 2, X-Men th uh, 2 just came out. I especially think that for comic book fans today, this won't work for them. I think it will, because there isn't... Okay. I wasn't exactly a fan of Gem the Holograms, but it has a similar tone to this. It's like, that movie's not nearly as fun as this is. But if you enjoy that Batman movie from 1960s, if you enjoy Batman Forever like I do, if you enjoy something like uh, Teen Titans Go on Cartoon Network or Lil Gotham that Dustin Union does, there's a uh, fucking mini Marvels. A lot of people are interested in fun superheroes. Squirrel Girl took over, like, the Marvel world by storm. Like, they're crying for Anna Kendrick to get her role. Like, Pitch Perfect has a similar tone to this movie. It's just, yeah, this is a metahuman. But going back to that whole dual thing with the sorry, I like that quote that Ophelia Powers has, where she's like, it, it's a double life. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, you can be docile but ferocious. You're the sun and the moon. A and they sell that in the movie. You have lots of times where she goes... I'm not Catwoman, I'm, you know, I'm Patience. Or then, like, Benjamin Bratt's talking to Catwoman, and she's like, that wasn't me. And it's true. Like, if you're walking around at night in this leather suit doing these outlandish things, fucking flying around from rooftop to rooftop, just from a psychological level, you're not the same person. The same way that Bruce Wayne isn't Batman, you know? Like, which one's the costume? Clark Kent isn't Superman, like... It is something that is inherent to the genre, and they tell it in a really cool way here, and I think it's the best thing to take away from it, because it doesn't just relate to the comic books, but also to what I would imagine it's like to be a woman. That sometimes, you know, you have to be this patient huh, woman and just take things as they go, but then sometimes you have to be ferocious and take insensitive and just do it all by yourself. I, I, I love the message, and if women actually saw this, they probably would have liked it. I buy the dual personalities of Catwoman mm -hmm. and Patience, but when it comes to that ending, I just yeah, don't no, buy. No, I don't bad. buy the voiceover when you know he's just sitting there and she's reading the he, yeah. or he's reading the letter. It's like, yeah, I can't be bad, with you. I, like it, that's just not set up, and he's just you know sitting there sipping on his coffee and just kind of going, yeah. okay. Like, like it's, yeah, I could not buy that. It, like, if it had, a, like if it said, was better built up for that conclusion, I could see that. But that does just kind of feel like a, the Spider-Man one ending. I just read for the sake of a, you know, I yeah. this is my life. This is what I do now. The first, Dare, it's my gift and my curse. Daredevil like, I, yeah. theatrical cut ends in a similar way too. Um, well, but there's there's other things that happen to there get to are, that point. But, you know, it's, it is a, a like, problem with superhero movies of the time, I think. But, yeah, that, I, I read some I don't some think shit. so. For, for Daredevil, it's especially earned. I mean, because, you know, it's not like Bruce Wayne jumping off the rooftop and going, like, wait for me. For Daredevil, it's I'm alone, and that's just how it is. Well, I, I think that they're, you know, the ending's bad. But I read this thing where there was like theatrical or not uh, they did screenings and people didn't like the ending so they made it better so i would like to see what that other one is i know you have the dvd i don't know if there's deleted scenes but if i had it if it was in my possession i would watch them 
Just another comparison, I don't know if you caught it, but there's a Hoobastank song in this movie. I don't know which one it was, but it's uh, when the neighbors are throwing their first party. But yeah, I mean, the only real negative thing about this movie is that they do over-sexualize Catwoman. There's a lot of male gaze going on here. But even See, still, I, I love her outfit. I supposed to be parody at that point. No, like, I don't think I, so. I can't look at that and take it seriously. I mean, just with the way she's walking, like, does Literally really on a find this sexy? I thought her outfit was sexy. I uh, really yeah, love I mean, the design, reveal. I mean, just the way that she's moving, it's like you're putting way, way, way too much. Like, it, it has to be parody at this point. She's not a human. She's a metahuman. It's Catwoman. You know, like, she... How seriously would you take someone that wears leather garb and cat ears and jumps around on rooftops at night okay, you and saw robs Pfeiffer banks? In Batman Returns, That's Tim right? Burton, though. Yeah, but that is fucking sexy. That Yeah, that is sexy, too. But that's a Tim like Burton that, movie. Like that, when I was like 10 years old and watching that, that got to me. Like compared to this version of Catwoman, I think this is more accurate. Like as far as I recall, she doesn't rob any like jewels or, or uh, stick up a bank or anything in that movie. She's just kind of the sex object slash secondary villain who's also kind of a good guy. And this, uh, you get to kind of buy into her her brain or at least at least a little bit understand who she is. Um, because of that dual nature, so much screen time is given to Catwoman, so much is given to patients that you never get a clear understanding. And, you know, we talked about Halle Berry. We haven't really talked about her performance. We, you know, we said it was good. Mm-hmm. Sharon Stone is fine. Benjamin Bratt's okay. Alex Bornstein's really cool here. I, I like her. I mean, it is a funny movie, but I like the comic relief she has. It gives you that whole humanistic standpoint because... Catwoman actually knows someone who's currently going through the throes of the problems with this bu line or whatever. Bu- well, so, so I think it's that chick flick best friend thing, you know, like the fat best friend that's there, like looking out for you, that knows exactly what you need. No, because if you watch Daredevil, Foggy Nelson is the exact same character. It's just it's the best friend in a movie like this. Spider Man. There's also there's what there's the gay office worker. At the I mean, same he's time so too. minor though. He gets like yeah, what, I know, maybe which a is minute. Like, it's funny. Time. It's like yeah, he only shows up really in the first scene, and then he's kind of just in the background. He's not that important. He's an office ridiculous worker. smile. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really just there for the sake of being there. I mean, look at the the girl that replaces Sharon Stone as the face for the company. She gets less screen mm-hmm. time than he does. You know, like this film is really about five characters. You got Alex Bornstein, Halle Berry, Benjamin Bratt, Sharon Stone, and her French husband. Uh, that's it. It has a very small cast. It's not a big story. It lets you buy into these characters, try to understand them. Like, yeah, you get some henchmen and some sidekicks, and, and you have, like, these little people that have a couple scenes, like the people next door that can't shut up. But it's just, you know, I talked about cat people at the beginning. Just career progression from another show we did on, uh, another movie from Death Cinema, Bullworth, to this is insane. Like, she's a nothing little just sex object in that as well. Like, she does mm-hmm. have a big part in the story. She is important. But here, it's, like, full-on just movie star charisma. Like, she could get anything done. She literally went balls deep here. She knew what she was doing. In the same yeah. way that, you know, you said, like, Showgirls, the same way that Paul Verhoeven directed that thing, this is done. Like they, they probably try to mimic it just without the NC-17 rating. No, well, it's, it's like I, I totally see that weird French sensibility from a guy that especially has experience working with Jean-Pierre Jeannot. And, like, I, I seriously f- see a Luc Besson influence here, like, just from the foot chases, like, especially mm-hmm. when, you know, she goes to that lab and she catches yeah, them. Yeah, she gets in the Talking vault. about the yeah, plans. Yeah. yeah, and there's just, like, the different colors and the different hallways and all that stuff. Like, it's just, uh, especially the club scene, like with the strobing lights when Catwoman's there. It's that club scene was so great. I know it's just it's way too audacious that, and it's so like perfectly made for the way that they want it to have it. But yeah, it's just it's one of those things where if you're not on board with this, I can totally see why you would hate it. But I would not call this terrible at all. Margot Robbie is apparently <laughs> getting a solo film for Harley Quinn. Or maybe it's not going to be just her, but she's producing the thing. She's helping with the writing, perhaps. Like It might be like a Gotham City Sirens thing, so maybe it's like Poison Ivy, Catwoman, Batgirl, you know, like all the female ver- uh, villains slash antiheroes slash heroes from Gotham mm-hmm. all in one flick. This is probably going to happen, especially because Suicide Squad, everyone is unanimous in saying that Harley Quinn's the best part. If she got a solo movie, I think it would be pretty similar to this. I think it would just be... A, a dozen laps a second, really fun, really zany, just like a, a wacky ride. 
it would like definitely this get much more close attention from the studio because I mean honestly like from th- this from Pitoff who I think has probably only got one film under yeah. his belt before this which it's like uh, called like Geese Coke and the, the first fantasy I looked it up. film it's, shot it's on one digital of the first, yeah one yeah. of the first digitally shot films so I mean I'm interested to check that out at some point point. and but, uh, Gerard did produce in it too so but the fact that this got made with a hundred million dollar budget that they gave it to someone who is not that experienced with this big of a budget and he's still able to turn something in that is this good that is this consistent even if it is way too odd for some people like i mean that's um it's a miracle that this thing exists honestly you mean kind of like david ayer he never done a blockbuster the budget for Fury is pretty big. I'm honestly, saying, that that movie, I, a lot more people like, should it, see it, that. It, it's it a has good a flick. lot of yeah, it has a lot of really high production values. And David Ayer, he made enough films. He was working in the industry long enough to get to to direct stuff and make stuff like that. I could see how he graduated to Suicide Squad, but this is just like it's a guy that no one's ever heard of. <laughs> And I'm sure it's a, it's a name that, yeah, a name that is far sillier than McGee. I think that, you know, people just look at it and they're like, what the fuck is that? What like, does Pitof mean? What's that translate to? I have, I, I thought, I kept saying Pitof. Like, I don't Pitof, even Pitof, know. Pitof, yeah, I, I don't know how it's supposed to be. Um, you don't, like, that's not French, so that doesn't mean something? Doesn't mean anything to me. Like, I saw his name on um, on Wikipedia's full name. Yeah, I, that, Christoph I, I don't have something, it in front of me, something. Yeah. But yeah, His name I is have Pitof, no idea. What, okay, <laughs> I have no idea what it is. Maybe but. it's pit of like pit of despair, like pit of his career ended because of this movie. As in, I don't know, he it's, probably fell off the planet after the this film tanked so hard. It's a weird ass name to have. Like it, it's, it's it's a weird you know, the, name. The, it's a weird movie, movie. And I, I mean, buy, that's the thing is like I could totally. Uh, see, I mean. This it's easy to call this bad. That's why I don't want to call it bad. Just the jokes write themselves way too easily. But you know, bad to me is something that just ends up being a clusterfuck. And this is a movie that knows exactly what it is. I wouldn't call this faithful to the source, even though I've never read it. No, it isn't. But I'm sure that that p- this movie pisses off a lot of people. So I can't say I'm surprised. I'm as big of a bat fan as any, and I really enjoyed it. Like I said, I you know I yeah, but broke it's not down Selena my notes Kyle, so as that's, well. That's what I said. Like as I broke yeah. down my notes, when I realized it wasn't Selena Kyle, I was like, "Oh, fucking go with it. Have as much fun as you want. Like as long as you're not spitting on the character, the literal character, I'm fine with it." Like they, but you know that a lot of people aren't going to think that way. A lot of people are just going to be offended by the fact that there's sure. a character named Patience Phillips instead of it being Selena Kyle. Like, if I saw this opening weekend and I found out it wasn't Selena Kyle, yeah, I would have been pissed. But there's enough here, there's enough homage. Like, apparently there's, like, a shot Michelle Pfeiffer for, like, a second that I didn't mm-hmm. catch. But during that jewel heist, like, the first real scene you have a Catwoman, Halle Berry totally channels Eartha Kitt, you know, the final Catwoman, just really well. It was, like, just her purr line. If I wrote a Catwoman movie, it would be pretty similar to this. Obviously, it would have more ties to the DC Universe, but just the tone, like, the character, like, I, I think it would be close to what this is. Because it is a lot of fun, and I like fun movies. And because of that, I'd buy that for a dollar. Like, this is... I want to own this. I want a Blu-ray copy of this. This is the kind of... It's like this or Showgirls. Pick which movie you want to watch tonight. You're going to learn how good a bad movie can be. This is a weird Wednesday screening at the Alamo Draft House. Like, I really want to push hard for them and say, hey, you should have this movie at one of these screenings. Get a full sold out crowd for this. It'll be fun. It'll be a lot like, of fun. It's, it's totally that kind of movie. The crowd would recent, be it's, amazing for this kind of film. It's just, it's such great cheese. Like, not everything in it makes sense. You know, like you talk about the high scene. It really doesn't make any bit of sense yeah, and the that grand she's going to leave the, the mask behind and then take no, everything no, no, else. No, 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 that makes sense because that's something that Catwoman does. She leaves a calling card so people knew that it was her. What I really okay, like about that maybe. scene, though, the necklace well, that she took yeah. where they bring it back into Egypt, the claws mm-hmm. that she has that she's able to cut the windows with and stuff, that was the necklace that she deconstructed. All right, well, you ruined my point, I guess, with comic logic, and I'll, I'll concede to that happily. But, yeah, just it's crazy. It's over the top. But if you can have fun with this, then have fun with it. You know, just I, if you want to call this bad, I'm I'm not gonna blame you. But it's the same thing with Batman and Robin to me. You yeah. Know? Like there's well, that, there's except great... that 
is really horrific. But where it's, it's a it's a consciously made movie too. I mean, like there are great memorable things about that movie that you will not forget. You can go to YouTube oh, the ice and puns. watch ice puns. Yeah, yeah, the ice puns amazing. video is amazing. You can see just as much stuff from this movie, like my just favorite the Catwoman jokes and all that. Like, it's like I, the basketball scene. My favorite line in Batman and Robin is uh, when Poison Ivy kissed Robin uh, when they're like on ice skates, and he's like. My wax lips Ripping are immune lips are, to your yeah, charms. Immune to your charms. <laughs> yes, like it's it's just as insane as that to me, honestly. So if this sounds anywhere up your alley, then yeah, by all means, watch it. Like, please if watch. If you get this. to see it with a crowd, fuck yeah, have fun. But if you're just gonna shit on this for the sake of it, if this turns you off right away at the beginning, then stay as far away from it as possible. Films like this are an easy target. Same way that Adam Sandler films nowadays are easy target. People yeah. like looking good in the same way you know you're at the mall you see some nerdy guy some fat chick you're gonna laugh about him you're gonna make fun of him some people are like that they don't know how to have a good time the only way they can do that is by making it a bad time for other people well but i mean let, let's be fair though like it, this can totally be like genuinely bad to someone like oh sure I, yeah you know someone I, that I has no that sense Freddy of humor. got fingered is a consciously made movie it is exactly what they wanted to make mm -hmm. it but it turned me off. That's like, okay. Right away, throughout. It's... And I, I'm, I'm just like, yeah, I, I can't help but hate that film. Thanks for listening. We hope it's been a pleasure. If you like this show and you want to hear more of our wonderful voices on a weekly basis, check out Two Cents. I'll recap what's happened in film, TV, and tech news. We're also on the titular Dollar Review Show, a spoiler-free critique of new releases or anything we've discovered on our own, whether that be TV, music, etc. You can find all of our content at dollarreviews.net. Follow us on Twitter or like us on Facebook at Dollar Reviews. And we're also on Google Play Music, iTunes, Pocket Cast, TuneIn, Stitcher, SoundCloud, YouTube, just about anywhere on the internet with hours of content available to you for free. But for those of you that feel that the show is worth your dollar, you can send us a donation at patreon.com slash dollar reviews. Contributions not only earn our undying love, but they also make it possible for us to improve our recording equipment and to give you the highest quality episodes possible. But more importantly, they'd be helping us acquire the content to review. You know, trips to the multiplex are expensive, and the more donations we receive, the more films we can review for your listening pleasure. If you listen somewhere we're currently not available, you'd like to contribute some talking points, send a death to cinema request, or even if you just want to laugh at us, you can do so by reaching out to us on social media or send an email to brian at dollarreviews.net. Or you can email me as well, steve at dollarreviews.net. You can follow me personally on Twitter at Brian Gillis, that's B-R-Y-O-N-G-I-L-L-I-S, and now you know how to spell the email too, and also under the same name on the Love You site, Letterbox, which acts as my film diary, where I rate films that I'm watching, write the occasional review, and even sometimes compile lists. You can also find me on Twitter at S underscore MTX, and also follow my film diary at Letterbox under the same name, where I log everything I watch, and sometimes write brief reviews. That's it for this week. Until next time, keep the change. <laughs>